Good morning. Welcome to our second day of Endo 2019 and the Endocrine Society's Obesity News Conference. My name is Jenny Glenn Gingery. I'm the Associate Director of Communications and Media Relations for the Society. Happy to have you all here today. Um, during this news conference, we'll, we're very pleased to have with us Dr. Fukan Burak of the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and Brigham and Women's Hospital, Dr. Leah Karem, a Pediatric Endocrinology Fellow at Mass General Hospital for Children and a Research Fellow at Massachusetts General Hospital, Dr. Lindsay Foreman of Massachusetts General Hospital, and Dr. Beatrice Sean of the Federal University of um, Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. So thank you all for joining us. Over the next 35 minutes, each of these speakers is gonna be sharing their findings. We'll have one Q&A session at the end of our time today. Please note this session is being broadcast live on the web. For the journalists who are tuning in on the web, we do ask that everyone in the room please speak into the microphones and identify yourself when you're speaking. Um, that allows everyone online to follow the conversation. Uh, for journalists who are attending online, welcome. You'll be able to type your questions into the webcast program, and we will pose those during the Q&A session at the end of today's news conference. I'd now like to invite our first presenter, Dr. Barak, to the podium. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Endo Society, Endocrine Society, for giving me opportunity to present our exciting data about a unique complication of obesity, which is asthma. So I will show you today our interesting findings on how a hormone born from a fat tissue causes a problem potentially in the lung through AP2, fatty acid binding protein 4. So. For now, there is no need to emphasize the emerging danger of obesity anymore, but I would like to mention and highlight again that obesity, in addition to being a standalone disease, it mostly comes as a package. So it's directly related to a disease cluster, metabolic disease cluster, such as type 2 diabetes, fatty liver disease, atherosclerosis, and asthma is among them. So which all share uh, kind of a similar lipid derangements, like the fat uh, born uh, derangements, and we call it immunometabolic underpinning. Both immune responses and metabolic responses come together uh, in a setting of obesity. So asthma, as you all may know, that it's a chronic inflammatory airway disease affecting almost 10% of the world population with uh, still increasing economic burden and prevalence, but yet limited treatment options. So classically, Beside having allergic asthma, mostly happens at the kids with uh, environmental exposures called asthma triggers, you would see it here. There are many other asthma phenotypes, and they're not allergic, they're non-classical, and they happen late onset in your life, and they're not classically proven as eosinophils, like the cells that we knew before, so the treatments, the classical treatments doesn't work. And uh, sorry, obesity is among them. So obesity-related asthma, there are two types of obesity, asthma uh, related to obesity. So first one is, we call it de novo asthma, so obesity induced by, uh, asthma induced by obesity, that's basically you become obese and then develop asthma later on as a complication of obesity. And that's late onset and non-allergic, and it's interestingly human predominant. The second one is classic early onset allergic asthma get worse with obesity. But the bottom line, when the obesity gets into the picture, they have more severe disease and faster progression. We call it higher morbidity, more problematic. And most importantly, they're less responsive to current therapies like steroids, the current known classic therapies. And this is not a small portion of the problem. So among uh, so the asthmatics, this is the CDC data, almost 40% are obese. So there is a great unmet need for a novel treatment. We, need, we have a new player in the game, so we need new treatments. So AP2, which I'm talking today, it's, we can call adipose hormone. Basically, it's coming from a fat tissue, released from fat tissue, travels to distant organs, and regulate the metabolic and inflammatory responses. And during obesity, something goes wrong, and AP2 levels in the circulation, in the blood, 
goes up. And we already know that from multiple human studies now, the increased AP2 levels uh, during obesity is strongly correlated with poor inflammatory, metabolic, and cardiovascular outcomes. So our hypothesis, very simply, if you're obese, have high AP2 in your blood, it's bad for you. So during obesity, AP2 levels will go up pathologically and then reach to the airways and contribute to the asthma. On the other way around, reduced AP2, low AP2 is protective in obesity. For example, in, in mice, the animal models, it's shown that both genetic deficiency of AP2 and if you target AP2 with drugs, for example, monoclonal antibody or small molecule inhibitors, they both results in significant protection from those diseases which related to obesity, uh, like diabetes, fatty liver disease, atherosclerosis, and asthma is among them as well. And more importantly, in humans, carrying a mutation, it's a natural occurring mutation, we call it low expressing variant, so they have low AP2 in their blood, naturally, and they're protective from diabetes, uh, dyslipidemia, cardiovascular disease. They have, for example, 10 times less likely to get uh, heart attacks. So it says the AP2 biology, what we see uh, in animal models, it translates to human. It's highly conserved and relevant. So to tell, uh, show you what it means to have obesity in your chest, I'm showing you the picture, we call it mediastinum, the open chest of the obese mice that we work. Sorry, this is not a very appetizing picture, but I think in obesity session, we're supposed to decrease your appetite before lunch anyways. <laughs> So uh, basically, you see all this white uh, here, it's adipose tissue surrounding the heart and the lung. And this is unfortunately exactly it, the same thing in humans. There are many surgical literature in the chest, fat goes uh, wrongly high. So if you measure AP2 from those mice, so as you see here in, in obese mice, it's four to five fold elevated, which we know that. And then we collected bronchoalveolar lavage fluid. Basically, I will call it BALF, that is a fluid that comes from airways. So you lavage, so basically you flush the airways with the saline through their trachea and then collect back the same fluid and measure AP2. And interestingly, we uh, detected AP2 there. So it means, and it was significantly elevated in the obesity. So it means that having AP2 in the buff also said AP2 increased locally uh, in a setting of obesity and might be the pathological mediator and direct link between adipose tissue and the lung. We call it adipopulmonary axis. So, and then we measure the lung phys actual physiology. So do a bronchoprovocation test. It's exactly the uh, human test. Uh, we do it in the human. It's a diagnostic test, metacolin challenge test. You provoke the uh, airways to see what is the response. So hyperresponsiveness means asthma. And we use this uh, mechanical ventilation for mice, which is fun to use. And as you see here, in lean condition, there's no airway resistance, there's no asthma. But just obesity, obese mice, nothing else, it dramatically increased the airway resistance. You see at the top, that's obesity-related asthma. But if you delete AP2 from the picture, the same obese mice, genetically, it's markedly reduced airway resistance. So it's kind of therapeutic. And it was independent from body weight, so it's not a simple mechanical issue. And we can go through this. But since, so I'm coming to humans, we know that AP2 levels high in the obese asthma models. And if you delete, it's protective. So as a proof of concept in humans, so we measured AP2 levels in the blood uh, from individuals uh, randomly selected from nurses' health study uh, in Boston. And very interestingly, so this is mostly healthy individuals. So whatever I'm showing, it's even undermined the, the problem because asthma frequency is just 3.3% in normal population is 10%. So what we found is AP2 levels increased in asthmatics versus non-asthmatics. But when you look at their BMIs, so it was elevated that only in overweight and obese subjects, not in lean. So if you're lean, there's no problem. But if you get obese, AP2 become problematic uh, there. And if you plot, uh, if you focus the asthmatics only, as you see here, there's a strong correlation between BMI, the body mass index, so it become more obese, and then AP2 level goes up. It's same pattern for asthma progression. So there's an overlapping pattern of AP2, uh, BMI, and asthma progression. So it's another uh, suggestion that that can be the contributor uh, to the problem. Then 
I showed you earlier, we detected AP2 in the airways. So to see whether we can translate to human, so we collected the bulk, the same fluid from airways in humans. So these are during uh, elective bronchoscopy procedures. So you did the same thing uh, in human. And then we again detected AP2 there, and it was significantly increased in obese humans, in locally in the airways. So basically, I'm just summarize here, so our hy uh, working hypothesis, AP2 levels goes up in obesity. It might be coming from the uh, locally mediastinal fat or distant fat. And in the airways, in lean state, or in the healthy state, there are less AP2 in the airways. But in obese state, or an asthma state, AP2 level goes up, both locally and systemically in the blood, and then contribute to the airway hyper-responsiveness and airway inflammation, which is the problem for asthma. So I would like to finish with thank uh, to my group. I'm just representative of them. So at Harvard School of Public Health, Sabri Ulker Center. Uh, so the lab members, they should get all the credit. Uh, they're extremely helpful. And my PI, Gökhan Otomishligil here, so who is the professor. Uh, he made everything possible. And Girol Tunchman specifically, we work shoulder to shoulder with him, so he should get all the credit for this project uh, as my dear mentors. And uh, with the Brigham uh, Endocrinology, Brigham Women's Hospital for their continuous support, and we collaborate with Asthma Research Center at Brigham with Dr. Elliot Israel, so I'm really thankful to him. And these are the funding sources that made the, uh, the science go through uh, smoothly. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Barak. Um, and now I'd like to call Dr. Karim to the podium. Good morning, everyone. Um, I will present our work showing that oxytocin reduces the functional connectivity between brain regions involved in eating behavior in men with overweight and obesity. Full disclosure, Dr. Lawson was previously a consultant for oxytocin therapeutics, and the other authors have no conflicts to declare. So we all know that obesity is a leading health concern. And data from the CDC shows that the prevalence of obesity was almost 40% and affected 93 million of US adults in 2015. And this is important since obesity is tightly associated with cardiovascular disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, and cancer, which are some of the leading causes of preventable premature death. So there is strong need to develop new effective strategies to treat obesity. But in order to treat obesity, first we need to understand what causes it. And we know that chronic overeating, and specifically with overconsumption of high calorie foods, is the key determinant of obesity. And fMRI studies help us to explore the neurobiological mechanism underlying this overeating behavior. So in these studies, we take lean individuals and those with overweight and obesity, and we ask them to perform an fMRI task in which they view high calorie food images, low calorie, plain objects, and blurred images. And we record the brain activity in response to these images in the two different population. And studies consistently show that in the state of obesity, there is hyperactivation of reward-related brain circuitry in response to viewing pictures of palatable food. So this hyperactivation in food motivation brain areas might represent a therapeutic target. And oxytocin might be one of the therapeutic agent. So this is a naturally occurring hormone produced in the hypothalamus. It is released to a wide range of brain areas, including those that are involved in reward processing. And animal studies show that oxytocin administration results in reduced food intake and body weight gain. And in humans, a single intranasal dose of oxytocin in men reduce hunger-driven caloric intake, as well as postprandial palatable snack consumption, representing hedonic eating. And in a small pilot study, daily administration of oxytocin for eight weeks in individuals with obesity resulted in weight loss. So going back to fMRI studies, those can help us elucidate the reward-related anoxygenic effects of oxytocin. 
In a previous study, our group used the food motivation fMRI task to study the effects of oxytocin on brain activity. In this study, participants viewed 100 stimuli of each condition. And what we found was that in subjects with overweight and obesity, oxytocin reduced the blood oxygen level dependent, the ball signal, to high calorie food versus non-food visual stimuli in the ventral tegmental area. And this is important since the VTA is the origin of the dopamine system and the reward circuitry of the brain. So while there is evidence that oxytocin reduces the fMRI ball signal to food images in food motivation brain areas, the dynamic changes in network activation have not been previously examined. And we were curious to know, how does oxytocin change the dialogue connectivity between the VTA and the key brain areas involved in processing of visual food stimuli? We hypothesized that oxytocin versus placebo would reduce the functional connectivity between the VTA and key brain areas involved in food reward and sensory processing, areas such as the insula, the amygdala, and hippocampus, when participants viewed high-calorie food images. And we anticipated that this effect would not be observed in response to low-calorie food images or non-food objects. In order to explore this question, we perform functional connectivity analysis on the fMRIs that were obtained in the study that I just presented. This was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover pilot study of a single dose of 24 international units of intranasal oxytocin. The study included 10 men with a mean age of 31 years and a mean BMI of almost 29 kilogram per meter square with a range of 25 to 30, 30.7. The subjects had overweight and obesity, but they were otherwise healthy and did not have diabetes. Subjects were initially seen for a screening visit to determine eligibility, after which they were invited to do additional visits. In one of them, they received oxytocin, and the other, they received placebo. Oxytocin was given after a night fast, and 60 minutes later, an fMRI was performed. So as I mentioned, in this study, we performed a functional connectivity analysis, and specifically a psychophysiological interaction analysis. This method helped us to determine which brain areas increase their activity in synchrony with a seed region of interest in a given context or task. So the aim is to identify task-specific changes in the interaction between brain areas, with increased synchrony being suggestive of task-specific increase in exchange of information. As our seed region, we selected the VTA, based on our finding of oxytocin-modulated activity in this area, and we compared the difference in connectivity between the VTA and the rest of the brain in response to the food, high and low calorie, and non-food images under placebo and oxytocin. So consistent with our hypothesis, we found that a single dose of intranasal oxytocin compared to placebo significantly attenuated the functional connectivity between the VTA and key food motivation areas seen in this figure. This figure shows an inflated brain, which allows us to see the activation inside the sulci. In yellow, you can see the most significant reduction in connectivity. And what is the role of these brain areas? So the insula has a role as a gustatory hub. It has a role as in subjective perception of food stimuli. And the somatosensory cortex, um, and the somatosensory cortex that affected by, was affected by oxytocin was significantly the brain region, that was um, specifically the brain region that represents the oral area. The operculum has a role in some sensory, sensory motor processing and was previously shown to have fMRI activation to test. The temporal gyrus also has a role in sensory processing, and the amygdala and hippocampus not seen in this lateral view of the brain both have a role in stimulus reward learning. Interestingly, the effect was seen only in response to viewing high calorie foods and not in response to the other images. So to summarize, 
we found that oxytocin reduces the functional connectivity between the VTA, a key hedonic brain region that drives effort to obtain desired food, and multiple brain regions involved in the cognitive, sensory, and emotional processing of food cues in men with overweight and obesity. The effect was seen only when processing high-calorie food images. And this is particularly relevant to individuals with obesity who demonstrate hyperactivation of brain reward areas in response to palatable food images. And since we know that overconsumption of high calorie foods is a major contributor of obesity, targeting the hyperactivation of reward areas with oxytocin may inhibit overeating behavior. And additional studies are required and are actually currently taking place to explore the potential role of oxytocin as a therapeutic agent in obesity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Karim. I'd now like to call Dr. Foreman to the podium. I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak today and for all of you for coming to hear about our work. Um, I'll be discussing obesity and reactive airway disease in HIV-exposed, uninfected adolescents. So I'll start with our main messages and then I'll backtrack on how we got to that point. Um, so this is the oldest cohort of HIV-exposed, uninfected individuals, or HEU as we call them. Um, and we found that in utero HIV exposure is linked to obesity and reactive airway disease later in life. We also found that a lower prenatal CD4 count in mothers with HIV, which indicates more severe HIV infection during pregnancy, was associated with a higher BMI in the HEU adolescents. And our findings are the first to implicate that HIV negative individuals with in utero HIV exposure are at heightened risk for obesity and metabolic disease. So now to backtrack um, and give a little bit more background. Oh, each year, over one million babies are born to mothers with HIV across the globe. And only 2% of these babies are actually HIV positive due to excellent public health efforts to pre prevent maternal to child transmission through the use of prenatal antiretroviral therapy. And that means that 98% of these babies are actually HIV negative, um, or what we call HIV exposed but uninfected, or HEU. And, and that's what I'll be referring to them throughout the talk. Um, and so this population is actually significantly growing and aging. Um, and now accounts for 18 million people worldwide, which actually equates to about half the total number of people that actually have HIV in the world. So a very large public health concern. And while we know that averting perinatal HIV infection has clear public health benefits, we don't know if there are any long-term consequences to in utero HIV exposure, even in the absence of infection. And that's what um, we were seeking to look at in this study. Um, so we know that in HIV, um, it's a state of maternal immune dysregulation in pregnant women with HIV. They generally have increased inflammation compared to non-HIV non positive pregnant women. Um, and they also generally take antiretroviral therapy to prevent maternal to child transmission. And so we hypothesize that this abnormal intrauterine environment might condition fetal development so as to predispose to um, metabolic and immune dysfunction later in life into adolescence and young adulthood. Um, and we selected to look at obesity and reactive airway disease as two clinical surrogates of metabolic and immune dysfunction respectively. So to complete the study, we utilized a patient data registry um, at a large academic health system in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and from that, we identified 50 HEU adolescents um, and wherever possible, we also um, located their mother's medical records, and so we're able to collect data during pregnancy. We also identified 141 controls from this same data registry who were matched to the HEU adolescents up to three to one on numerous demographic factors, age, sex, race, ethnicity, and zip code as a surrogate for socioeconomic status. Um, and wherever possible, we also located the medical records of the mothers of these controls um, in order to obtain prenatal information. 
Um, so we manually reviewed these charts to extract health information. Um, BMI was standardized for age and sex using CDC growth charts. And obesity was defined by the classic criteria of a BMI of greater than 30 um, or greater than or equal to the 95th percentile. And reactive airway disease was based on clinical report. And so here are the demographic characteristics of our HEU cohort versus controls. Um, and as you can see, the median age is 18. Um, and this actually represents the oldest cohort that we are aware of of HEU individuals studied to date. Um, you can also see that it's about half male um, and has a uh, splayed racial distribution, predominantly white, black, and Hispanic. And here are the prenatal characteristics of the mothers of both the HEU adolescents and controls. Um, you can see that they're relatively similar in age, um, that their median BMI is in the slightly overweight range, um, and that the prevalence of obesity was very similar between groups as of about 25%. Um, which is very important because maternal obesity is an important risk factor for offspring obesity. Um, and so it, it's important to note that they're similar between groups. Um, we can also see that the duration of HIV at the time of pregnancy um, for the HIV positive mothers was about four years, um, and 93% were receiving antiretroviral therapy during pregnancy. So here are our main findings, um, and what you can see is that the prevalence of obesity in the HEU adolescents was strikingly high at 42% compared to 25% in the controls. Um, and you can also see that the prevalence of reactive airway disease was also substantially higher in the HEU adolescents compared to controls. And we next wanted to look at maternal factors during pregnancy that might predict the, the risk of obesity in the HEU adolescents. Um, and so we looked at various HIV-related parameters, um, HIV duration, CD4 count, viral load, and antiretroviral therapy regimen. And what really struck out is that a low CD4 count during pregnancy suggesting more severe HIV infection in the mother was associated with an eight-fold increased odds of obesity in the HU adolescents. Um, and so to show this slightly different way, um, you can see here a correlation where a lower CD4 count during pregnancy is associated with a higher HU adolescent BMI. And we found this to be really remarkable because these two parameters, the CD4 count and the BMI in the, in the adolescent, are something that were collected over 12 years apart in time. And the fact that they're so strongly correlated was really striking. Um, and this relationship persisted when we controlled for numerous uh, prenatal maternal factors, including age, BMI, antiretroviral therapy regimen, as well as HIV duration and median income based on their zip code, so just using U.S. Census data. And so in conclusion, um, in the oldest cohort of HIV-exposed uninfected individuals studied to date, in utero HIV exposure is linked to obesity and reactive airway disease. A lower prenatal CD4 count in mothers with HIV which is associated, was associated with a higher BMI among HEU adolescents. And to us, this really indicates that there is a strong biologic link between the in utero HIV exposure and the long-term metabolic health of offspring. Our findings are the first to implicate HIV-negative individuals with in utero HIV exposure at being, as being at heightened risk for obesity and metabolic disease. And this study adds to growing evidence that the intrauterine environment is an important yet very underappreciated determinant of metabolic health. And actually, potentially, this population might actually yield insights for other groups exposed to abnormal intrauterine exposures, such as individuals born to mothers with obesity or gestational diabetes. And for this population, this large um, 18 million people population, additional studies are needed in order to further elucidate the metabolic risks associated with in utero HIV exposure so that screening, prevention, and treatment can be appropriately targeted for this group. And I'd like to thank um, my um, fellow colleagues at Mass General in the Program of Nutritional Metabolism for all of their help in various ways with this work, um, as well as the NIH, uh, my funding source. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions afterwards. Thank you so much, Dr. Foreman. I'd now like to invite Dr. Sean to come to the podium. Thank you. Good morning. 
I'm Beatriz Chan from Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, Brazil, and I will present the study entitled Unhealthy Snack Intake Modifies the Association Between Screen-Based Sedentary Time and Metabolic Syndrome in Brazilian Adolescents, findings from a countrywide survey. Metabolic syndrome is a clustering of central obesity, high blood glucose, high blood pressure, and lipid abnormalities. It is associated with cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. It occurs in almost 25% of American adult population and almost 8% of adolescents in the U.S. Sedentary behavior is characterized by activities with low levels of energy expenditure in a sitting or reclining position, such which are represented by TV watching, uh, using the computer, uh, and playing video games. These habits are frequently associated with other harmful habits, such as distracted eating, drinking soda, eating junky food, or eating excessively. And these habits, we know, are associated with obesity. Eating unhealthy snacks in front of screens is an, a, a, a habit that is probably harmful. But the relationship between this and obesity is well known, but not with metabolic syndrome. This is the, a large study uh, uh, conducted in Brazil from 2013 to 2014, the ERICA study, study of cardiovascular risks in, in adolescents. And we can see here that eating unhealthy snacks in front of screen was reported by, by almost always or always uh, females, uh, girls, in 41% and 37% of males. Mechanisms involved in the association between screen-based sedentary time and metabolic syndrome remain unclear. The detrimental effects of screen time were previously attributed to displaced time spent in physical activities. However, this has been shown to be a different construct, as long as sedentary periods does not, do not necessarily subtract from long periods of physical activity. Findings from, from studies exploring the association between screen time and metabolic syndrome remain controversial due to methodological inconsistencies. Eating behaviors could modify and or partially explain this association. Our aim was to investigate the association between screen-based sedentary times and metabolic syndrome and whether this association is modified by unhealthy snack intake in front of screens. The study of cardiovascular risk in adolescents is a multicenter, school-based uh, national study, a cross-sectional study, in a population of adolescents from 12 to 70 years old from private and public schools, urban and rural areas of Brazil municipality, Brazilian municipality, with more than 1,100 inhabitants. This population was stratified into 32 geographic strata. This data was collected between 2013 and 2014. So we started our collection with a written informant consent or assent and three types of questionnaires. One for the adolescents, one for the school direction, and one was sent for the parents. In the questionnaire that the adolescents answered, uh, there were issues on sociodemographics, habits such as smoking and drinking, and physical activity, and also sedentary time. Then we applied a 24-hour dietary record. Anthropometric uh, measures were taken with weight, height, and waist circumference. Blood pressure was measured three times. And final, a blood, blood sample was collected for cholesterol, glucose, and triglycerides. The metabolic syndrome was defined using the International Diabetes Federation criteria, and screen time was self-reported. The adolescents uh, should answer the question, during a normal weekday, how many hours do you spend watching television, using the computer, or playing video game? games? And they can say no, zero, till seven, more than seven hours a day. And health snack intake in front of screen was also self-reported. Here are the first results. We collected data from 33,900 adolescents, 59% of them were females, 48% were physically active, and 85% usually eat unhealthy snacks in front of screen. The prevalence of metabolic syndrome was 2.6%. Uh, the prevalence in accord, uh, according to the screen time categories was 1.9% for less than two hours a day, 3% and 3.3% in the other 
two categories. The association between screen time and metabolic syndrome was uh, evaluated using the odds ratio. Uh, the odds ratio is a statistic that attempts to uh, quantify the strength of the association between an exposure, here the screen time, and an outcome, here metabolic syndrome. And when it is uh, more than one, we can say that there is a pos association between the exposure and the outcome. Note that uh, we are not saying that screen time causes metabolic syndromes. There is an association. You can see that we used for the reference uh, lower than two hours a day of screen time. And we can see that there was a dose response gradient uh, of the prevalence of metabolic syndrome from uh, less than two hours a day, three to five hours a day, and six hours a day. That is the highest screen time category. And we, we see that uh, there were a higher, uh, important association with metabolic syndrome. However, further analysis uh, using uh, different uh, viewings of TV viewing or com using the computer and using also the report of eating or not eating unhealthy snacks in front of the screens uh, shows us clearly that when the adolescents say they did not uh, eat unhealthy snacks in front of TV uh, in, in the first line, and uh, not, not uh, eating unhealthy snacks in front of the computers, there was no association between screen time categories and metabolic syndrome. However, this association was very strong for the two categories, three to five hours a day and more than six hours a day, uh, in front of TV and in front of the computer when these adolescents uh, uh, reported eating unhealthy snacks in front of screens. We concluded that longer screen-based sedentary times are positively associated with metabolic syndrome. This association is modified by the consumption of unhealthy snacks in front of screens. Strategies to assess, to address metabolic syndrome in the pediatric population should aim at limiting unhealthy snacking while in front of screens. I uh, want to, uh, to thank all the financial support from many Brazilian uh, institutions. Uh, the students of the schools and also all the graduate and undergraduate students that helped collect this data. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sean. We'll now be opening up the question and answer session. Again, I'd just like to remind everyone to please speak into a microphone and identify yourself clearly so that those on the webcast can follow along with the discussion. Hi, Dr. Barak. I'm Jody Godfrey. I'm editor of Endocrine Web. And I'm curious um, whether you know if the subjects that are obese, if they are um, addressed with lifestyle or other typical obesity management um, man procedures, if their weight goes down, does their asthma resolve? And therefore, they don't necessarily need treatment. Yeah, that's a great point. Actually, that should be the main thing before coming to this point and talking about different pathological players coming into the game. That's really the best thing to prevent or treat in that way. So actually, it's known that if you, I showed you like there are two types of asthma related to obesity. The first one that happens with obesity, actually, if you lose weight, it, it gets significantly better. It can resolve. The second one, the allergic asthma, get exaggerated or get worse with obesity, that uh, doesn't resolve back. It's improved a little bit, but the inflammatory uh, status stays in. But there's also literature on bariatric surgery. For example, the people have uh, a more like very severe obesity who gets the uh, bariatric surgery to lose weight. They uh, also have beneficial effects on asthma. It's Sometimes it depends where you start with, but it definitely improves with weight loss in all of them. But totally resolve is a different issue, but that's actually the best strategy, even if you have it in that way. So that's a great point. Kristen Monaco, MedPage Today. My question is for Dr. Karam. Um, I was wondering if you've done any research or have any ideas on how often the spray would be used is it a daily therapy, or do they have to spray it before every meal? So, 
So actually currently we're doing a big NIH funded uh, study in which 60 subjects are enrolled to, give, uh, to be given oxytocin daily before every meal and at bedtime for eight weeks. Um, so there is only one study in which oxytocin was given, was given for eight weeks before, and it was a pilot study with good results, nice result with weight loss, um, but there is only one such study. The rest of the studies looked at oxytocin administration just with a single dose. So we still need more information to understand how, what would be the effects of prolonged administration. Question. So there were no side effects seen with the one dose. Do you expect any side effects to be seen with continued use? So correct. Um, until now, oxytocin seems to be very safe with an intranasal administration. Uh, there were no side effects with a single dose, and we're currently in the midst of the big study and so far. Everything's okay. <laughs> this is Kari Oaks, Clinical Endocrinology News. Could you uh, comment, uh, who, who is enrolled in your ongoing NIH study? What's the study population? Men and women. Men and women, okay. And would you expect to see any difference in women since women through the lifespan are exposed to a lot more oxytocin? Correct. Correct. So most of the studies with oxytocin were done only with men, and the reason is that oxytocin's levels are highly affected by the menstrual cycle and by estrogen levels. Um, so with small studies, it will be hard to adjust for estrogen levels, but when you look into you know, a population of 60 subjects or 30 subjects, you will be able to control for that. There are many studies showing that females with hypothalamic amenorrhea, or uh, athletes, or uh, in other cases, they have completely different oxytocin profile than those who have um, get their menses every four weeks. And when they do get their menses every four weeks, oxytocin would flux fluctuate according to the menstrual cycle. Thank you. Hi, uh, Phil Nafer, Endocrine Today. I had a question for Dr. Foreman. Um, you said that this, uh, these findings could kind of help um, with treatment strategies for adolescents that are um, exposed to HIV in utero. Um, what kind of interventions do you mean? Uh, would that mean kind of being more aggressive when they're younger so that it doesn't lead to obesity later on in adolescence? Yeah, thanks for that question. I think it's you know, very early in terms of this research. I mean, this clearly shows that there's a strong signal that there's increased metabolic disease. Um, I think the next step is to further establish the phenotype, so to do a prospective study and actually see what all the issues are with blood glucose, fatty liver, things like that, um, but also looking at the mechanisms. Um, so, you know, I, my hypothesis is that it's the in utero environment, um, but that really needs to be determined, and that lo the low CD4 count during pregnancy in association with higher BMI really, to me, draws that link. Um, but I think if, if that does prove to be the case, if it is something with maternal inflammation or immune dysfunction during pregnancy, perhaps even doing an intervention during pregnancy to reduce inflammation might be something. Um, if we see that it's more related to lifestyle uh, issues, um, you know, possibly contributing, then, then definitely addressing those issues. Um, and definitely knowing, as a first step, knowing, as you mentioned, that there are, um, that they're more at risk, I think at least carefully screening them and following them up through life and, and making sure that they're not developing diabetes and intervening quickly. Right now, um, these kids, they're followed for the first two years of life to rule out that they don't have HIV. Um, and then they basically return to their regular pediatrician and are not necessarily flagged as having had in utero exposure anymore. It's not really prominent in their medical record. Um, and so, you know, the, the clinician sort of loses sight of that and that they could be at high risk. So I think that's an important area too. Oh, hi. I'm Lisa Ningolan from Medscape. Um, I have another question for Dr. Foreman, but first of all, I wondered if someone else on the panel would like to comment on her findings about the implications for these um, presumably millions and millions of children around the world that will um, have been exposed to HIV 
and could be ticking time bombs for even greater levels of obesity than what we are already seeing. Would anyone like to weigh in on that? <laughs> no? Well, maybe you'd like to speak about it, Dr. Foreman. I mean, do we even know, as you said, they're followed for two years in the US, in other countries that, you know, should this be something that should be added as a risk factor? I mean, I absolutely think that it should be added, at least if not, you know, it, it still needs to, I think, be further studied, but the fact that there are in utero exposures and we know that those do determine metabolic disease later in life, even maternal obesity, gestational diabetes, those usually get lost from someone's medical record over time too. Um, so I think in general, um, clinicians should pay close attention to in utero exposures um, because, you know, with further research, those might come to mean more. Um, and in terms of the findings, I mean, the, so we know this is a United States cohort where people are in an obesogenic, resource-rich environment, um, and they have access to the, all the usual medical care. Um, so, you know, I think another question is, is this the same, is this going to be the same in a place like Africa? That is a, a separate study in and of itself. Of course. But I think, um, you know, in this more enriched environment, that might be like the extra trigger that's needed to for this in utero exposure to end up causing obesity is that these people are you know then exposed to the typical types of food that kids tend to be exposed to in the US. Do you think that, that kids should be told themselves and, and, and carry that with them? You know, you're, you you will do they generally know and do they remember? Yeah, that's a really good question. So there's a lot of literature about um, this issue about in you know disclosure to a child that they were exposed to HIV in utero. HIV in particular is a is a tricky topic because you know it's unlike gestational diabetes or maternal obesity, it might be more stigmatizing for the child to know that their mother has HIV. So right now, it's something that the mother can choose to disclose. I did look within our cohort at. Um, what percent, I mean, this is also based on medical record documentation, but what percent, I, it seemed, were aware of their mother's HIV, and to us it seemed about half actually had documentation of that, whether that, you know, they still could know and it's just not documented in the you medical record. There was documentation that half of the mothers had told their children. Yes, okay. but I think that that's not, you know, that this is limited because it's yeah. looking at medical records. Okay. So, you know, I think doing some sort of survey or something could be really interesting. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of literature encouraging mothers to disclose this to their children um, in order to, you know, facilitate a dialogue between the mother and child about, you know, risk factors and things like that. Um, and also because there could be these long-term risks and the first step to addressing that is for people to have this in their medical record and to know. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sherry Rowan with Everyday Health, and my question is for Dr. Karam. And can you tell me, would this potential oxytocin therapy only be appropriate for people who you can prove have this hyperactivated brain reward system? Would you have to show that in advance for this to be potentially considered as a therapy? I think, um, logistically speaking, it will be difficult, right, um, to obtain MRI before we give this medication. I think the literature showing that in the obese population there is hyperactivation of reward brain areas is very, very convincing. Um, and I think um, it is something that is common to many patients with obesity. I, I couldn't say that it is true for everyone, but it is it is consistently shown. Um, given if this will be proved to be a um, medication that we can use with prolonged administration and it, with a very safe profile, I think it would be reasonable to try it. It's the same way you have many agents uh, to treat uh, pharmacologically for obesity. And it's a common practice for a physician to try one of the medication, and we know that not all patients would respond the same. And so you have this arsenal of medications, and you're trying combinations sometimes and individual medication one by one. Um, so I don't, I don't anticipate that we would want to prove that 
this particular patient shows hyperactivation of reward areas in response to palatable foods. Great. Any other questions? Dr. Sean, I was wondering, do you have any advice given your results for parents? Is there something that they should be doing in response to this information? Thank you. Um, yes, uh, it would be interesting. But however, we have uh, studies in uh, literature with multiple uh, interventions in schools, uh, with parents, with families, uh, considering education and other uh, healthy habits to educate uh, parents and children and schools. And, and the results are very... Um, are, are not so good, so it's very, it's very, um, um, it's possible that it will not result in anything. You know, uh, it's possibly we have to uh, have um, actions that were more widespread. You know, uh, like laws and environment uh, changes, uh, not uh, particularly uh, working with groups or schools. You know. Uh, it, for example, prohibiting uh, unhealthy snacks uh, in schools and uh, when you offer to children, but uh, it's very big, this problem, you know. Great, thank you. Uh, for, Dr. for Dr. Sean, um, I noticed that the, uh, the ORs for being like a television screen time versus computers or video games are uh, higher. Do you think that's just uh, coincidental or do you think that because TV watching is more passive than interacting with uh, like a computer or a video game, do you think that that has any indication for why it was a little lower? Yes, it's a, a little difference, you, um, but you are right. Uh, TV viewing is more passive and we did not, uh, we could not uh, separate the different behaviors uh, because we have compu uh, playing video games that uh, there are kinds of video games that the, the children and the adolescents move and uh, dance and we, we could not separate this uh, different uh, video games and uh, computer use, you know. Uh, so it's possible uh, that we have some uh, confusion inside the, the variable that we studied. Uh, we, we say that it's a, a residual confounding. We, we adjust all that statistics that I presented uh, by many things that we know that interfere with the re this relationship, but we could not separate different uh, sedentary behaviors. You are right. Great. Well, thank you everyone for your questions and thank you to our speakers for taking the time to be with us today. Enjoy the rest of your experience here at ENDO 2019.